I think that we're living through the Bitcoin gold rush era. And I think the Bitcoin gold rush era started January 2024. And I think it runs until around November 2034. So it's about 10 years. And I'll tell you why. Because 93.5% or so of the Bitcoin was mined at the beginning of this period. But in November of 2034, 99% of all the Bitcoin that will ever be issued will have been issued. And so that, that halving is, is uh, very symbolic. People talk about Bitcoin you know, issuance coming out over the next 100 years, all the way till 2140. But the truth of the matter is, the last 100 years, you're only getting 1%. And actually, of that 1%, 90 basis points of it is coming in the, in the 12 years that follow 2034. And then it's 10 basis points, a tenth of a percent. Today, we're exploring a fascinating perspective from Michael Saylor, who paints the next decade as the Bitcoin gold rush era, a time of unprecedented opportunity and transformative potential in the world of cryptocurrency. Sailor forecasts that by November 2034, 99% of all Bitcoin will have been issued, signaling a pivotal moment in the digital assets journey. This period represents not just a shift in wealth creation, but a significant evolution in how we perceive and interact with digital assets. Before we delve deeper into this topic, I'd like to invite you to subscribe to our channel and hit the like button if you find our content insightful. Now let's explore the implications of Sailor's predictions and what it means for investors, enthusiasts, and the global economy at large. Mainstream investors, they have all the money, right? Nine, there's $900 trillion of wealth out there. There's only $1 trillion in Bitcoin. So 99.9% .9 of the money, of the wealth, is not invested, right, in the asset class. So a lot of people that don't understand what this is have a lot of money, and yet we've got a 10 year period when there's going to be an explosive increase in education, right? As Bitcoin, Bitcoin's going to go up and as the price goes up, more people are going to get asked and they're going to like reject. They're like, stop asking me. I hate talking about this. Like we don't, we don't like it because it's not, it's like gold. It doesn't generate cash flows or they don't understand. If you don't understand uh, perfect money, Right? What what's what's wrong with gold? Gold has admissions. Gold is inflationary. That's why it doesn't work. If you don't understand that, then you don't understand why digital gold is better than gold. So you don't understand Bitcoin. You don't understand money, and then you haven't really thought very deeply about property theory or capital theory. So you definitely don't understand digital capital, which means you don't understand digital energy. Which means that when someone asks you, you're going to buy it. Your answer is, of course, I'm not going to buy it. I don't get it. But what I say to people, right, like if everybody read all these books, if, if they thought about it for a few hundred hours, tomorrow they would wake up, they would all buy Bitcoin and Bitcoin would be $5 million a coin. And then we'd be doing this podcast and you would say, Mike, all, my, all, all the comments from all my followers are, is it too late? I would say, well, it's too late for you to get insanely rich. You're not going to get 100x, right? If you buy Bitcoin at 50,000 when it's 500 uh, five million, you're going to be bragging to your kids that you got a hundred X year return, right? So it's going to be too late for that, but it's not too late to buy it because it's still better to buy the thermodynamically sound digital asset, which doesn't have all of the liabilities of real estate stocks or bonds. It's still going to go up in value faster than the S and P index. It's still going to be a better after tax return than all owning sovereign debt. It's still going to be better than owning physical property subject to acts of God, you know, force majeure and all the other physical limitations. So it's still going to be the best investment. It's just not going to be the investment that got you the 100x return that you were going to brag about. And so there's no reason to worry, right? Or fret. You don't want people to figure this out, right? Like, like if they figure it out, you won't, you have 10 years during which you can work. And you can buy Bitcoin while everybody else disagrees with you and doesn't understand it because they're intellectually lazy or they're a different generation. It's like me saying it's 1905 and in 15 years, everybody's going to have an automobile. And now you know. 
Okay. Well, you have 15 years to get rich in the automobile business, figure out, are you going to set up the dealership in New York City? Are you going to start a company? Are you going to be a salesperson? What are you going to do? You have 15 years, figure it out. This is better than that, but this is a 15, 10, 15 year head start. I had this analogy. It's like you could be working at a McDonald's. You could be working for $10 an hour, right? But if you're sweeping the $10 an hour in an asset that goes up by a factor of a hundred, yeah, you know, you're getting paid a thousand dollars an hour. Okay, so how long do you want to work at a thousand dollars an hour? Well, you want to work at a thousand dollars an hour as long as you possibly can, because once people figure it out, then you go back to your ten dollar an hour job, right? So, so we're in the gold rush period. Uh, people are, when they think about it, they're going to realize this is this is the period during which everybody in the world started to realize Bitcoin is digital capital. And there's capital. There's a digital transformation of money, and that uh, you want to hop on top of that. You you want to exploit that. And there's a thousand ways to do it. Maybe it's just work really hard at your job and buy Bitcoin. Maybe it's start a company. Maybe it's do something different. You decide. I don't ever regret any stacking I did. I mean, we bought Bitcoin, at, you know, below ten thousand. We bought Bitcoin probably above sixty thousand. I, I mean, at the end of the day. We never know when the world wakes up, gets rational, and then it runs through the all-time high, and then we regret not not having bought more. I, I would encourage anybody that thinks maybe I'm too late. I mean, I, I think I would say, well, maybe you just haven't studied this enough, right? Don't give me your money if you're not confident. Give me your time, you know. And if you if you don't want to invest the time, maybe you don't care about money that much. It must not mean it must not matter to you that much. If it matters to you then you spend enough time to figure out whether I'm right or whether I'm wrong. And there's plenty of information out there for you to come to your own conclusion. As we navigate through the complexities of the Bitcoin ecosystem, Saylor highlights a critical gap in mainstream understanding and adoption of Bitcoin. With $900 trillion in global wealth, yet only a fraction invested in Bitcoin, the potential for growth and adoption is immense. Saylor points out the pivotal role education and understanding play in bridging this gap. As the digital gold era unfolds, the comparison between Bitcoin and traditional gold offers a profound insight into the future of value storage and investment strategies. This segment dives into the essence of what makes Bitcoin, or digital gold, superior to traditional assets. The non-inflationary nature of Bitcoin, coupled with its digital scarcity, positions it as a perfect instrument for wealth preservation in the digital age. So in the 20th century, people basically bought sports teams Ask yourself, what do rich people own when they get rich? They bought sports teams, they bought real estate, they bought companies, they bought land, they bought timber rights, they bought oil rights, they bought gold, they bought, you know, bonds. They just bought stuff. Why? Because they knew if they left their money in the bank, it was going to dwindle away. Buy anything. They buy Picassos, they buy art, right? They buy, they buy stuff. So there was never a perfect digital capital. There was never a digital instrument where I could, if you were a rich Russian and you had a choice between buying a bunch of real estate in Moscow or buying Bitcoin, well, with uh, ex post facto hindsight, looking back for the last 30 years, okay, now let's play that out and you're a rich Nigerian. Now you're a rich, you know, a Turk. Now you're rich in Lebanon. If you, and, and we don't have to be rich. You can Anybody with any amount of money anywhere in the world. You know, you've got the last hundred years of history. You live in Germany in 1930. What do you want? A building or Bitcoin? You know, you live in you live in Argentina. What do you want? You want to own land? You want to own a building? You want a company? You want Bitcoin? The currency is going to collapse five times in 140 years. Five times, right? Okay, so this is why we want to study history. If you study history, you're going to find that the currency collapsed thousands of times. In fact, on average, it collapses everywhere. <laughs> Probably it collapses everywhere on average every 50 years in the history of the world. And that's maybe me being charitable. So is it too late? Well, can you actually take all of your property, put it in your pocket and leave the country on one day notice if you need to? If not, then you're probably not too late, right? So if you go through that exercise, you can't take your building with you. You can't take your bars of gold with you. You can't take your stock shares with you. You know, you people for a while, they bought paintings thinking I'll roll them up, but you know, it might not be the easy to 
You know, and the average person can't buy Picassos, and they're not quite exactly at the price point. How do you buy two hundred thirty-seven dollars of Picasso a week, right? So, so Bitcoin represents digital property. What's the value of digital property? Hundreds of trillions of dollars. Is it overvalued? Not yet. It's a trillion dollars right now. So, when it's a hundred times more valuable than it is right now, will it be overvalued? Not likely. It's probably still going to be appreciating faster than every other thing you can buy. Why? Because it's better than every other thing you can buy. Show me a hotel you can put in your pocket and teleport. A billion dollars of gold is like 3,000 pounds, right? How, how are you going to move that, right? Give me a company that's going to last through the next three CEOs, right? Do you know who the third CEO will be after the, the one that runs the company now? And do you, do you trust that person, right? The S&P 500, haven't we established there's a 99% failure rate? These are the winners. There's a 99% failure rate to generate shareholder value amongst the 500 best companies in the world. Now, if there's a 99% failure rate amongst the 500 best companies in the world, then what's the failure rate amongst the 100 million companies in the world? You know, And, and the, what's the most successful nation, nation state currency in the history of the world? Well, if it's the dollar... The dollar's lost 99.8% of its value in 100 years. Maybe 99.9% of its value. Debate. You could debate whether it's 99.8 or 99.9% of its value. Every other currency in every other country lost 100%. If you're sitting around wondering, is Bitcoin overvalued? The question is, overvalued versus, versus what? Right, you're you're gonna buy something, right? You're owning something in lieu of Bitcoin. What is that something which is better? Right, that's the real question. In the concluding part of our journey, Sailor draws a compelling parallel between the acquisition of physical assets by the wealthy in the 20th century and the opportunities presented by Bitcoin today. The concept of digital property as a secure, portable, and non-depreciable asset challenges traditional notions of wealth and asset management. Sailor's insights into historical currency collapses, and the durability of digital assets like Bitcoin provoke a reevaluation of investment strategies in the face of inevitable economic fluctuations. The question isn't whether Bitcoin is overvalued, but rather how it compares to traditional assets that are subject to depreciation, physical limitations, and geopolitical risks. The future of finance is unfolding before us, and Bitcoin is at the forefront of this transformation. Thank you for joining us on Unscripted Crypto. If this discussion has sparked your interest, or if you're seeking more in-depth analyses of the cryptocurrency market, remember to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Your support enables us to continue providing you with the insights you need to navigate the ever-evolving world of digital finance.